He said he was the perfect one to speak to God on behalf of Job. We're talking about Elihu. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemmer. And I'm Janice. And this program is a program that takes you through the Bible, Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Every year today we're in Job chapter 33 to 36. Very, very good. Now I want to tell you, Corey is helping us too. Corey, what's up? We are going to be continuing to focus on the ancient city of Shechem today, specifically looking at a temple that was built there. All right, very good. And what did you study today? Well, we're still talking about our friend Elihu. He continues to be on the book, so we'll continue studying him. Ryan, what's up? Today I'm going back to the beginning as I examine the life of the first human being, Adam. All right, this is very interesting because Elihu claimed to hear what Job was saying, but he really didn't hear him. He heard his own opinion. Anyway, we'll talk about this as we study through the book of Job 33 to 36 today. Over the past few days on Quick Study, you and I have been taking a look at the ancient city of Shechem. We've looked at its history and interaction uh, in the Bible. We've looked at the puzzling relationship that Israel seems to have had with the Shechemites during the days of Joshua and the conquest of Israel. And today we are going to be focusing in on the archeology span of Shechem as it revealed a massive temple fortress. Thanks to ongoing archaeological work that began in the early 1900s, much is known about the ancient city of Shechem. Shechem is a city featured often in the Bible, and historically it held a great amount of power and influence. This power is likely why Abimelech, the son of Gideon, launched a bid for kingship at Shechem, as recorded in the biblical book of Judges. While he did rule for three years, Abimelech's hold was not to last. He was betrayed by the men of Shechem, whom he then defeated in battle and turned his sights on destroying what is called the fortress or stronghold of the Temple of Baal Bareth. Abimelech set fires along the walls of this tower, eventually suffocating and burning all those who had huddled themselves inside. Excavations at Shechem in the 1920s unearthed what was then the largest fortress temple known in Canaan. With two towers guarding its entrance, Shechem's temple still boasts 17-foot thick foundation walls. On top of those walls would have been high mud brick and wooden walls supporting the multiple stories of the temple. Stairwells in the front towers would have reached those floors. In the courtyard that spread out before the temple, there was a large sacrificial altar and three standing stones. Two of the stones flanked the entrance, while the largest occupied its own spot in the courtyard. It was five feet wide and around ten feet tall, and though broken off in antiquity, it still stands five feet tall today. The late Professor Lawrence Stagger has advocated for the natural association of this fortress temple with Abimelech's temple in Judges 9. The temple was originally built sometime in the 16 or 1500s BC, making it an already ancient stronghold by the days of Abimelech. Standing stones in and around Shechem are mentioned in the biblical histories of Joshua and Abimelech, so it's no surprise that they've also been found at Shechem's fortress temple. Unfortunately for us, these stones were not carved with the writing that once adorned their surface. They were plastered and painted on, all of which has since been lost to time. It's very interesting, isn't it, when you're able to look at the ruins uh, of, of a city that interacted, that people in the Bible interacted with. You know, when, when you see those rocks, did Joshua see those rocks? Did he walk on those rocks? How many levels down have the archaeologists really uncovered? Uh, so this concept of this Migdal, this temple fortress being uh, there and being the one, uh, you know, that interacted not only with Joshua, but then, you know, you've, you've got Joshua going to Shechem and being very uh, involved in Shechem at the beginning of Joshua and at the end of Joshua, but then also in Judges with this really brutal but interesting history of Abimelech and uh, his, his revolt and his eventual death. So we've got a lot of history happening in this time and space. Now, it also might be uncomfortable for you when we're looking at pagan temples and, and we see major biblical characters interacting with them. I mean, if this was the, the temple fortress uh, of Joshua back in Joshua 24, we see Joshua kind of commandeering this 
this temple, uh, you know, we see this in Joshua, him commandeering a temple and saying that it's a temple of the Lord when, when really it has been there already. So was it always a temple of the Lord? It doesn't appear so, but, but he kind of commandeers it. So we see things in the, the Bible that maybe we as modern day Christians aren't exactly comfortable with, but we have to take a step back and go, wait a minute, what is the reasoning for that? And we always find one in the scripture. Elihu thought he was perfect in all the ways that he proclaimed, but his words were nothing to the God of the universe. Uh, some claim Elihu is a kind of Jesus Christ, but there's nothing in the contents of the Bible that speak to the reader that particular situation. In fact, God interrupted Elihu's talk with, quote, who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge, close quote. That's Job 38 too. It seemed that God was speaking collectively about Job's friends, Elihu and Job's words. Elihu's youth was displayed by his fast talk about mankind. We must do our best to see the words that are serious and meaningful. As believers in Jesus Christ, we are told in Matthew chapter five, verse 37, quote, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, close quote. We must always be careful what and how we speak. This is an important lesson that I'm learning as I go through life. And I must take care to listen to the words that I use. Job 33, verses 1 through 14. But please, Job, hear my speech and listen to all my words. Now I open my mouth, my tongue speaks in my mouth. My words come from my upright heart, my lips utter pure knowledge. The Spirit of God has made me and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. If you can answer me, set your words in order before me. Take your stand. Truly, I am as your spokesman before God. I also have been formed out of clay. Surely no fear of me will terrify you, nor will my hand be heavy on you. Surely you have spoken in my hearing, and I have heard the sound of your words saying, I am pure without transgression. I am innocent, and there is no iniquity in me. Yet he finds occasions against me. He counts me as his enemy. He puts my feet in the stocks. He watches all my paths. Look, in this you are not righteous. I will answer you, for God is greater than man. Why do you contend with him? For he does not give an accounting of any of his words. For God may speak in one way or in another, yet man does not perceive it. Job chapter 33, verses 1 through 14. listening to Elihu. Elihu was a young man. He was there where Job was and, and uh, all of Job's three friends talked to him, but they couldn't convince Job. So Elihu arrives on the scene and he's just telling everything to everybody. Well, you know, I'm younger, but you guys, I, it's important for me to express my opinion. And, you know, it sounds like a lot of the stuff that we hear today about people expressing opinions. And uh, it's not that opinions aren't important to listen to, but when it comes to life issues, the only opinion I'm interested in is God's opinion. Anyway, we're going to be looking at this today. Take your Bible guide and turn it to today's reading. This is very interesting. And do me a favor, if you can, uh, pray about what God would have you give when you write to us. That would be tremendous. That helps us keep the lights on, the cameras going, and the audio happening and all that. So we can continue to broadcast every single day on the internet and here, so we appreciate it. Now, uh, when you also write to www.biblediscoverytv.com, go there and click on Donate. Make a donation in any amount, and it'll take you to the PDF files. 
And the PDF files are great of the Bible guide. And you can also get one. If you just say, send me a Bible guide, they'd be happy to send you a Bible guide. Very, very good. Really, the only way to articulate this uh, words of truth or ways of truth today is to simply say, listening to Elihu. You can't really do anything except listen to him. He's so strong at saying what he's saying. We're going to read uh, chapters 33 uh, to 36. Very interesting. And as we read this, we need to consider what God is saying to us. We're going to look at Job 31 or 33 verses 1 to 14. Father, I pray in Jesus' wonderful name, you would help us to hear and understand what it is that we need to do and the principles that we need to have in our life so that we can learn how to deal with people in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, learning how to deal with people is important. And let's look at Job 33. We'll learn how not to deal with people. Here it is. He continues, but please, Job, hear my speech and listen to all my words. Well, what's Job going to do? He can't really do anything. He's suffering. Verse two says, now I open my mouth. My tongue speaks in my mouth. Well, that's bright. My words come from my upright heart. Wow, his heart's upright. He tells us that. My lips utter pure knowledge. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. If you can answer me, set your words in order before me. Take your stand. Truly, I am your spokesman. Truly, I am as your spokesman before God, I also have been formed out of the clay. Now, this is interesting because Elihu said he was the perfect one to speak to God for Job. No one was better except him. No one on earth speaks to God for us, beloved. No one. We speak to God directly right now. God hears your prayers. So we learn here that in this passage, Elihu says, I'll speak to God for you. When Job is talking and he's praying and he's asking God, and Elihu says, no, he's not going to listen to you, but he, he'll listen to me because he knows my opinion and I'm great. That's what Elihu says. So beloved, when we talk to people, we don't need to speak like that. We don't need to have that sort of attitude. We, we need to have compassion. Compassion is important. We need to remember that, beloved, so that we can understand how to deal with people, people who are going through difficult times, people on the other side of the world who are happening, having problems. We have recently deaths in many different cities of our own. We need to speak with compassion, and we need to ask God for that today because Elihu does not have it. Let's go back to the scripture, Job chapter 33, verse 7. It says, so no fear of me will terrify you nor will my hand be heavy on you. Surely you have spoken in my hearing, and I have heard the sound of your words saying, I am pure without transgression. I am innocent, and there is no iniquity in me. Yet he finds occasion against me, Job said. Job is being quoted by Elihu here. He counts me as his enemy, and he puts my feet in the stocks. He watches all my paths. Again, this is interesting because Elihu claimed to hear what Job was saying, but he didn't. See, many will talk kindly to us, but God tells us the truth. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs that the kisses of an enemy are those things which will fool you. Uh, the kisses of an enemy, but the words of those who tell the truth are sometimes painful. We need to hear that. We need to hear that and understand that a friend tells us the truth regardless. And he tells us the truth according to God, not like Elihu. As we continue on in the scripture from 12 to 14, verse 33, it says, Look in this, you are not righteous. I will answer you, for God is greater than man. Well, that's another remarkable discovery. Why do you contend with him? For he does not give you an accounting of any of his words. For God may speak in one way or in another, yet man does not perceive it. You know, Elihu is most amazing to me because he spoke of who God was, 
but did not talk of God's character. He had some truth, but not all of the truth. Only God can communicate to us the way that he wants to. God is desiring to talk to you. God is desiring to talk to me. When we pray on a daily basis, when we come to the Lord, read his word and we pray daily, God reveals himself to us. God speaks to us, beloved. I want to hear God. I don't know about you, but I, I pray every morning. I say, Lord, I'm here. I start with the Lord's prayer. I say, Lord, I'm here and I'm going to pray for the various people. and I'm going to pray at the end. I'm going to help you, help me to understand you. Very important. Now, when we understand that, we realize that Elihu spoke of God, but did not talk of God's character. We realize only God can talk to us. When we see that, when we understand that, it becomes very important that we realize that when we pray, we're talking to God, but when God speaks to us, only he can answer our prayers. We pray to uh, a, a God, but when you pray to God Almighty, let me tell you something. He not only hears you, but he answers you correctly. So today, may we hear that. May we pray to God and say, Lord, help us. You know, God always requires an answer when we talk to him or talk about him. And that's exactly what we're going to discover on the next quick study where God speaks to Job. He begins to talk to him in 86 questions. This is a very interesting time over the next two days. Make plans to join us because we're going to study it. Ryan? Well, today I'm going back to the beginning of history, to the sixth day of creation to be exact. After God made the earth and the stars and the sun and the moon, after he had made the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the animals of the dry ground, he formed the first man out of the dust of the ground. This was Adam. At the culmination of creation, after God had made the heavens and earth and all therein, he specially fashions beings in his own image, according to his likeness. Indeed, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. This was Adam, the first man and progenitor of the entire human race. Fittingly, Adam means man, mankind, or humankind, and is a wordplay on the Hebrew term for ground. Interestingly, though Adam has just been created, to an outside observer he would appear adult-like. Indeed, a certain level of physical maturity was necessary in order to be fruitful and multiply. Adam's ability to understand God's words and to communicate also illustrates that he possessed a level of mental maturity. Indeed, once placed in the Garden of Eden, God commands Adam that he may eat freely of every tree, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat of it, God says, you shall surely die. Then, in a display of his creation, God brings the animals before Adam to see what he would call them. Through this process, Adam realizes that none of them are comparable to him. He alone bears the image of God. As he is thinking on these things, he falls into a deep sleep. While sleeping, God takes out of Adam's side and forms the first woman. When Adam wakes and sees her, he says, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. And they were both naked with no shame. Though God had provided them the perfect life, a tempter was in their midst. The father of lies comes as a crafty serpent 
and convinces the newly married couple to partake of the forbidden fruit. At that moment, their eyes are opened. Now subject to full exposure, they hastily cover themselves with homemade garments of fig leaves and attempt to hide from their loving father. But nothing is hidden from God. Sin has now entered into the creation and God shows them the price for it, death. Before their very eyes, he slaughters an animal. The blood is for the covering of their sins and the tunics of flesh is for the covering of their skins. On top of this, they are cut off from the life giver. God drives them out of the garden away from the tree of life and Adam is now forced to plant his own garden in the now cursed ground. Both spiritual and physical death began that day. Indeed, after 930 years on earth, and after Father and Cain, Abel, Seth, as well as other sons and daughters, Adam returned to the dust from which he came. Though Adam was literally the son of God, because of his fall into sin, a second Adam, a second son of God, would now be required to restore our lost relationship with our Creator. It really is an unfortunate end. Adam was never meant to die. None of us were. But because he disobeyed God's only command, it changed everything. Now there was separation from God, and death entered into the creation. Now a second Adam would be required, a restorer of the breach. And all because Adam decided to stand idly by while his wife was being deceived. He ignored God's command rather than confronting Eve and the lies that Satan was speaking. Now there's many important lessons to be learned here, but one is that we need to always put the word of God over any man, woman, or anything. God's words must have total authority. God's word is a life manual. If we follow it, we'll be safe. We'll explore the life of Eve on the next program. You know, that's interesting, Ryan. I mean, God's word has authority over everything. That's and, right. and we need to really understand that and think about that because God word, God's word tells husbands to, you know, love their wives yeah. as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to wash her with water and a whole business. And we need to understand that in today's world. That's one of the things we don't understand as right. a family. If we're following God, we need as husbands to talk about, okay, Lord, I'm following you that I need to do what you say. Mm -hmm. And I need to really focus on my ac actions and uh, my activities in my wife and help her. Mm -hmm. That's really important. Yeah. It's a very good study. Yeah, well, God's laid out principles in his word, you know, to help mm -hmm. us live life to the fullest, really. Yeah. You yeah. know, I mean, it's, <laughs> God's not trying to, to cut all our fun out. That's not <laughs> it at all. In fact, he wants us to live life to the fullest and to have fun. He mm -hmm. does. You know? Mm -hmm. so. The idea of having fun is, is a whole new concept to some <laughs> people mm -hmm. and yeah. to many. Uh, but the idea is that you enjoy yourself. That's the main thing. And I, I'm a firm believer that God has a sense of humor. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's yeah, for sure. You can know? see it. Yeah, so, yes, for sure. You look at some of the animals you see in creation, and you're like, yeah, well, God has a <laughs> sense look, of humor. Hey, you look at cats. I mean, cats. I, and I, I have a cat, so you know, don't, don't take offense to that. I have a cat, so yeah. Very good. Excellent reporting. Very well, I, you know, and, and on that same vein, I, I'm thinking about you both now have little children of your own. Mm -hmm. And as a parent, there are certain things that you teach your children from a very young age. And it's not because you want to suck the fun out of everything. Mm -hmm. It's because you want to live, you want them to live life to the fullest. Mm -hmm. You want them to be healthy. You want them to be strong. You want them to be safe. And, and so as your children grow, you're going to see that more and more. And, and, and that will even deepen your love for God even more because you understand then. And when you can put that into perspective, that God is the perfect heavenly father and he he has set things for us not to take away fun, but to actually do the reverse of that, to give us life and life more abundantly, that mm. fullness of life so that we can live protected and healthy. And And I think that it's important for us to remember as parents, now I'm speaking, of course, having parented three mm -hmm. kids, but uh, I, it's important for us to recognize not to correct our children to make us feel better but to correct our children when they need correct when they need the correction and mm -hmm. where they need the correction mm -hmm. because that becomes very important mm -hmm. to discipline takes discipline it takes a lot yeah. of discipline mm -hmm. yeah. you know that's very good well, we must move on. We are talking still about Elihu and something that you said today uh, struck me. And that was that Elihu told Job that he heard him. 
that he heard all his words. And actually, we, we can see that here. Um, uh, 33 verse 8, surely you have spoken in my hearing and I have heard the sound of your words. And then he gives a list of things he quotes back. Um, and, and you know what? Th this is reflective upon myself as well. And maybe you can hear this as well. And it's not really my point for today, but I think it's one that's well well taken. Have you ever listened to someone who has come to you because they, they want to talk to you about something and the whole time that you're listening, you're already coming up with the answer for them. <laughs> You've already yes. got that answer. So you're only partially listening. I think that's part of Elihu's difficulty here. And I think as, as people, uh, we need to really get that art and skill and ask God to help us with being able to listen, to really hear people with a heart that's open out of love, to respond out of love. And, and, and sometimes we're not going to have the answer unless God gives it to us, but we need to actually take the time to hear what they're saying and not try mm -hmm. to formula in our mind or make a formulation of what we're going to answer to solve their problem. Okay, here's the other thing that I wanted to point out today. I thought it was interesting how Elihu basically sets himself up like God here. And it really struck me differently this time as I read through it. And he goes all out, you know, I open my mouth, my tongue speaks in my mouth, my words come from my upright heart. And he really kind of puffs himself up. But it got me here. He says, the spirit of God has made me and the breath of the almighty gives me life. Now hear, hear how he says this to Job. He says, if you can answer me, Set your words in order before me. Take your stand. Doesn't that remind you of what God said to Job? Mm -hmm. And I thought, whoa, that's a little bit too close for comfort to me. Because God says to Job, now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. This is something coming from a perfect God, a perfect heavenly father. Um, Elihu goes as far as to, to tell um, Job, truly, I am as your spokesman before God, or literally, I am as your mouth. So, mm. you know, mm. so I just... That's very arrogant. Uh, uh, it is. And so I, I want to be reminded myself today, and maybe you out there too, there are things that we need to really take a step back and go, hmm, God, help me not to have that same kind of an attitude. Help me to know where I am in you and help me to be a help to my friends to actually listen and not speak and jump too quickly to a point that is my decision, not theirs.